Well, good morning. It is good to gather together before God's Word. Let's open our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 7. We'll read the first three verses. Nehemiah chapter 7. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own homes. Let's pray. Father, we ask you this morning that as we look into God's word, that you, Lord, will look into our hearts and that you will speak into those hearts words of life and truth, lead us, guide us, establish us, Lord, in our faith in you as a result of this encounter in your word this very day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a friend who is a missionary, but he's not a missionary in the usual sense of the word. I, I've known him for about 35 years, and he's been on the mission field the entire time. Yet, he has never been more than a 25-minute drive from where I'm standing right now. My friend is a missionary to Old North St. Louis. It's an area just north of the Edward Jones Dome. My friend's roots are white, middle class, southern, he makes a living as an English professor at a major university here in town. But his calling is to go and live as a witness for Christ in a poor, predominantly African-American section of the city. He and others from his church, by distressed and even abandoned homes, they move into them and then they rehab them. As a result, this produces economic stabilizing of the neighborhoods. They patronize local businesses, they support local schools, and their church is a hub of community life. He once said to me, do you know what the hardest thing about rehab is? Theft. People breaking in and stealing copper wire air conditioning units, granite countertops, appliances, tools and supplies. And he says there's only one way to combat this. A heavy investment up front in locks and lights. This doesn't make the problem go away, he says, but it keeps you in the game. So much rehab work is abandoned because of theft. It's a crying shame. This is the sixth in a series we call Going to Rehab. The title speaks simultaneously of the direction in life. I am going to rehab, as well as the purpose of God. He is going to rehab me. We're studying a section of the Old Testament in which the Hebrew people are undergoing a significant and necessary period of rehab. Because they had lived for generations, ignoring God's ways and disobeying God's word, the Lord allowed them to be conquered by the Babylonians. They were deported from their homeland for 70 years. But now, miraculously, they've been allowed to return. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah recount how these returnees, during the process of rebuilding and restoring their city and their cultural life, they were also being rehabbed themselves. In the passage we just read this morning, 
The major construction part of rehab is complete. The walls of Jerusalem have been rebuilt. But Nehemiah, the leader of God's people, knows that there are enemies who will seek to cause this rehab project to fail. So again, back to Nehemiah 7.1, listen to what he does. He says, after the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and musicians and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gate gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. This is all done so they can preserve their rehab work. To preserve their rehab work, Nehemiah calls for locks and lights. The gates are barred. All eyes are on the walls until the sun is hot. Now, now the city walls, their physical protection from enemy attack. That's what the walls are for, that physical protection. Now they've been rehabbed and safety precautions are put in place. And I guess the question comes is that of course that has to happen because why would you build walls if you don't secure them? And, and walls, their effect is only to inhibit enemy attacks. Walls give you time to marshal resources to repel invaders. But you have to patrol those walls, don't you? The walls themselves will not be enough. They need to have lights and locks, eyes on them, things barred. Now, follow me carefully here. All along throughout this series, we have seen paralleled with the physical reconstruction of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of God's people. The walls fell the first time because of invaders. The invaders came because God's people had fallen in their covenant loyalty to God. Sin, injustice, the abandonment of devotion to God who had called them into being as a people led to their chastisement by being conquered and deported. But now they're back. But as the city is rebuilt, the people too need to be rehabbed. In chapter 7, we see the walls get locks and lights, eyes on them. In chapters 8 and 9, the people get the same. You know today when, when people go to rehab for substance abuse or other kinds of addictive behaviors, medicines play a relatively small role in all of that. Therapy, individual and group, therapy addresses the inner life of the person in rehab. The therapy that addresses what a person does is called behavioral therapy. We can view this as the locks. The therapy that addresses how a person perceives, how he thinks, how he feels, that's cognitive therapy, and these are the lights. Now, would you be surprised to find out that this is just what God does through Nehemiah's leadership? Nehemiah makes some strategic moves to ensure that what God has once rebuilt in his people is not lost, is not stolen. So let's take a look now at the lights and the locks that Nehemiah promotes for the spiritual well-being of God's people. The first that we'll look at are the lights, the locks and the lights of God's word. Let's read from the last verse of Nehemiah chapter 7 and then into verse 8. And as we do this, I'm going to comment along, all right? So last verse 
of Nehemiah 7 and into chapter 8. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, the women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Notice what day it is. Oftentimes, as we said before, days and times are important when they're mentioned in Scripture. It is the first day of the seventh month. Now, for some of you may, may remember, we talked about this some weeks ago when we looked in Ezra. Way back in Ezra, this was years before this time, on the first day of the seventh month, they laid the slab for the altar. It was the first thing that they did to start rebuilding their spiritual life. And why would they choose the first day of the seventh month? Because according to the Hebrew calendar, the first day of the seventh month is New Year's Day. It's New Year's Day. They built an altar on, the, on New Year's Day, and now, years later, they bring the word because it's time for a new start. It was a new start with worship at the altar. It's a new start now with the word of God. We continue. Verse 8. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. You see, throughout time, the scripture is presented and much of it people can, can get, they can understand, just the hearing of it is very, very important and very worthwhile. All of us should have individual time in the Word. But it's also important to recognize that sometimes the Word of God needs to be taught. Uh, and that's what's going on here. That it, they're having a study of God's Word. They're listening to what it says and having explained to them what it means. Verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were, all, who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people who had, had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law, Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Why, Why were they weeping? They're having the Bible read to them. Why are they weeping? Well, first of all, what actually is being read to them are probably the first five books of the Bible, all right? The Torah. This is what they would have been read to them. Well, and why are they weeping? <laughs> They're weeping because most of them had never really heard it read to them. They had religious traditions that went back when they were in exile and even before that. There was traditions that had come along, but undoubtedly for most of the people, they had never actually heard read aloud to them in its entirety, in its fullness, the Word of God. And they had no idea all the things that God's Word had called them to. They had no idea how specifically and meaningfully and lovingly God had moved in their national lives. As they're reading through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, they're hearing about creation, humanity's fall, the, the call of Abraham to become a people of God's own choice. They're hearing about winding up enslaved 
in Egypt and then being mightily delivered from Pharaoh by a God who saves and sets free. And they're also hearing that there are some things that God expected them to do. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Verse 12, then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. So we have this scenario where all the people are gathered and it looks like for about six hours they read to them from the Torah, from the first five books of our Bible. But what's important to notice here, look at the outcome. Verses 13 and 14 and then down to 17. Verse 13, on the second day of the month, the next day, the heads of all the families along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. The coal company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. You see, the light of God's Word locked them into doing God's Word. What had they read? They had read this section in the Old Testament about how God had commanded Israel every year during the seventh month to spend some time living in shelters, living in tabernacles, living in booths. They would construct these things that uh, made out of uh, branches, etc. And they would spend some time living in there. Why? To remember how much God had provided for them during those long years in the wilderness, from the time they had left Egypt to the time they were entered, able to enter the Promised Land. That God had provided and taken care of them during that time. And God said, annually I want you to do this. I want you to build these little tents, these little shelters, and live in them for a little bit so that you'll remember that I take care of you, so that you won't forget that, so that you'll still live in the security of that. So they get the light of God's Word and it locks them into doing it. And, and the funny thing is, is that although it specifies that they're supposed to do this at the 15th day of the seventh month, they heard it on the second day, and they just jumped ahead. Thirteen days earlier, they said, no, we're doing it right now. We haven't done it for generations. We're doing it right now. You hear the Word of God, and you do it. You get the light, and it locks you in to a way of living. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who has built his house on the rock. The rain comes down, the, storm, the streams rose, and the winds blew against and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. James writes this in James 1.22, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. The light of God's word leads us to lock in obedience. We change because the word of God given to us and the spirit of God who lives in us are two powerful means of God's grace. God's grace that saves us. God's grace that rebuilds us. Secondly, let's take a look at the locks and the light of confession. God's people responded to the realization that they had not been doing God's word. And when they realized it, they began to do it. But as we all know, God's word also brings light to that which we should not have done. Locks that we have broken. This occurs next. Nehemiah chapter 9, first three verses. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. 
those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord of their God for a quarter of a day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. So, as we proceed through the month, we're at the 24th day now, they are still interacting with the Word, but in a different way now. The Word had told them some things that they should have done, and they started doing those things. But the Word has also told them some things that they should not have done. And they recognized that both their ancestors and themselves were guilty of disobedience. So they listened to what the Word says, its commands, etc., and then they confess we have not done so. What might surprise you as you go through the rest of chapter 9 is that the bulk of their confession is not what they have done. The bulk of their confession is not what they have done. It's about just how good God is. Just scan through chapter 9 with me. Let me point a few things out. This is all stuff that they are saying, they are confessing to God. In verse 6, they tell God, you give life to everything. Verse 8, you've kept your promise. Verse 9, you saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt and you heard their cry. That God, you, you, you see what's going on in our lives, you care about it and you respond. Verse 15, in their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven. In their thirst, you brought them water. God is very specific about caring for genuine needs of his people. Verse 19, you did not abandon them. You did not fail to guide them. This is all about the greatness, the goodness, the mercy of God. Where's the lock in all this? They've got some light about God. Where's the lock in all this? The lock is because we live as creatures of a very good and merciful God. We have to give an account. They did, verses 33 to 35. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them, in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. There were locks that were in place that they just busted open. But there's more light, verse 31. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. What a testament to God's great grace. His love is neither merited nor is it diminished by our behavior. Our sins may be many, but his mercy is more. Lines from a song that we sing in worship. But let me ask you this question. Seeing how they confess, can you do that? Can you confess in this way? Name out your sins. Identify your disobedient habits. Can you give voice to your carnal, selfish, indulgent ways? Can you snap a label onto your ungodly attitudes? Do that. Confess in specificity, but do it enveloped in the light of the goodness, love, and mercy of the God who made you. Our spiritual ancestors in the time of Nehemiah, how were they made aware of God's faithfulness over time? 
Well, what have they just been doing lately? What have they been doing this whole first month of this brand new year? What have they been doing? They've been hearing the Word of God. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, etc. They've been hearing God's Word. And out of that encounter, meeting God in His Word, they're aware of His faithfulness and His goodness as much as they're aware of their own lack of faithfulness. Today, what do we do? We look back to the cross of Jesus, the Word of God. We look to both the Old and the New Testament. In the New Testament, we find passages like this, Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6. Paul writes, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We read passages like that and see the extent of God's goodness and faithfulness to the, those of us who were his enemies, who have been reconciled, and who are now being rehabbed through his life. The light of God's word tells us we're secure. We're secure in his faithful love. We're secure in our place in his forever family. We're secure. The light comes on. It's security light. But you might say, yeah, Tim, but those locks, those locks that are in God's word, those shalt nots, those commandments, they come with consequences. And I'm not feeling the love there. Let me ask you this question. What was the purpose of the locks on Jerusalem's gates? Was the purpose for those locks to keep the citizens in? Or was it to keep the enemies out? The function of the prohibitions we find in Scripture are not so much about being restrictive as they are about being protective. If thieves can break in and undo the work that has been done, we will always abandon rehab projects in homes, in neighborhoods. People will quit rehabbing if you can't keep the place locked up. If a visitor can bring alcohol or drugs into a treatment center, relapse is inevitable. If God's locks seem unloving and impinging on your freedom, you need to ask for some light to see how you are actually being protected as a precious one. If you step over the fence regarding how the Bible delineates appropriate sexual expression for the sake of experience or freedom, tell me, when you really start to care about your partner, what's the experience like when they are being intimate with someone else? How free does it feel? Tell me have your insides tied up in knots. If you disregard the biblical commands to love, nurture, provide for, and discipline your children because you have to be authentic to your own goals, dreams, and needs, what's it going to be like 
when your own kids now grown authentically distance themselves from you. In, in seeking self-fulfillment by investing your time, resources, attentions, and heart to success and attainment and acquisition in this world, how fulfilled are you going to feel when your life is ebbing away and you've made no investment in what really lasts? There are locks on your sexual expression, gates on how you do family, fences on your freedom to do what you want to in this life. And they are placed there by a God who has always been faithful to you, always looked out for you, loved you with an everlasting love, and he's placed those there to shield you from a sworn enemy whose intention is, as Jesus declared in John chapter 10, verse 10. Look at it. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Your loving Father in heaven intends to do a vast rehab project in your life. I know that many of you have discovered that the Holy Spirit has shown you in great detail what it is he is up to in your life in this regard right now. To preserve that work, to protect you, there are locks and lights that he has put in place. Walk in the light of his word. Honor the locks too. See them for what they are. Put in place to protect loved ones from an all too real enemy. And put in place again to be signs of God's great grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the locks and the light that you have placed in our lives. We, we thank you for your word. Lord, create in us a spirit like our spiritual ancestors in the time of Nehemiah, where we are willing to listen to your word with such joy, to receive it as such a gift from you, both to remind us of your great goodness, your mercy, your love towards us and to warn us. Let us receive those locks as well and be responsive to do what your word says. Cause us, Lord, to, as we recognize all this rehab that you are doing in our lives in this season, cause us, Lord, now to be willing to place the locks and the light that you've given us by your spirit, through your word, so that this work is protected, cherished, and so the work can continue. Continue that work in me. All of us ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We will see you next time. <laughs>